You could feel that aviation was going to open up. There was some hope that central banks could just keep a lid on inflation. And then, you know, stuff happened, right? You know? And in particular, of course, you know, I've been and done this conversation in Australia, and I've done this conversation in America, but here more than that, anywhere, we understand the implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in a very direct and visceral way, not only in things like changes to oil prices. And I think because that arc of likely track of the economy and circumstances looked okay, the situation we've ended up in in 2022 is unusual. For CEOs, I'm not getting a click, there we go. The world is inverting and getting quite disorientating. There are things going on now that they weren't anticipating, and they are very good at anticipating, actually. I've done research on CEOs for a long time now, and I can see when they're anticipating, and they're very good at it collectively. This obviously didn't fit the narrative of where things were supposed to be heading, but also some of the factors at work are not within the normal range. So if you can remember you know, the financial crisis, and even if you can remember back to you know, the dot-com crash, and if you have organizational memory and leadership memory of how things happened through all those crises, through 9-11 and everything else, even if you've got all of that, you're not really fully equipped to deal with what's going on right now. So it's quite disorientating. For example, when we do the annual chief executive survey, and we've done it using the same question for a dozen years, always the top issue is growth. What is your number one priority growth. Now, as you can see, like, the priority for growth in the minds of CEOs has been declining. They're having to deal with more and more crises. And so our ability to say, you know what, I am confident we will grow this business next year is going down and it's getting dented. And it's now, you know, gotten down to quite low levels relative to the whole of the previous dozen years or so. So growth still matters in the chief executive perspective, obviously, but it matters less because other things are coming to the foreground. For example, when we ask this question about priorities, we find that customers really don't have very much direct attention. Now, let me, let me just explain what I mean there. If, 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 if a CEO says, you know, customers are my priority, then the words customers are coming out and we're talking about customers, then it's a customer priority. But we've got companies that are saying, oh, you know what? There's inflation going on. And you know, though it's not impacting us too deeply, one of the things we could probably do is get away with increasing our prices. You know, we've had difficulty for quite a long time with our price suppression in our industry. We don't have the margins we'd like. In the fog of war, we can raise our prices. We'll get away with it. That may grow your revenue. I would not call it customer-centric thinking, right? That's what I mean. On the other hand, though, Employees have become a big focus for CEOs, right? It's moved right up the priority list. So they have to be directly involved with employee-framed issues where perhaps a few years ago they would mostly leave it to their general management and their CHRO. Globalization as a concept which has been with us for 30 plus years as a major inexorable macro trend defining the environment around us into which we will form strategy is dented. You can see from this chart that most CEOs would rather agree with the statement that we have re-globalization. You know, it's continuing, but there are rotations of the shifts in power between nations, perhaps some separation between the orbits of China and the orbit of America. Perhaps you're starting to think about moving things out of China quietly to Vietnam or somewhere else like that. So it's not like we're saying everything has to come back to the headquarters country. We're not deglobalizing like that, but there is a significant amount of rotation going on. And the general idea that in future we can find an even cheaper place to do stuff, that's really ebbing away. The demands from investors and from boards for better profit returns or growth in revenue, the things you would expect investors and boards to be demanding of the CEO, they're there, 
But as you can see on the left, they are diminished, okay? They're down a bit, they're moderated. Investors have realistic expectations. They want this company to survive and thrive in the mid to long term. They're not pushing as hard for current quarter, current half returns necessarily. So on the one hand, what really drives business leaders most of the time, which is my investors demand growth in revenue and in profits, is diminished. But on the other hand, what has not gone down, despite COVID, despite the crises that we have today, what has not gone down is sustainability. So you know, there's always a question going into COVID and coming out the other side. When we, we say that we believe in sustainability, but when we hit the first crisis, will we stick to that or will we be fair weather friends only and move away? So now we've got like a rebalancing of the relationship between at least these two factors, some other ESG besides, but this one in particular. Now all of this data comes from our survey, which we run annually, and we do most of it right now. So it's in field now with CEOs, but we do a summer update, the first quarter to one third of the, of the sample. We've been doing it in the same way for over a dozen years now. So we, have, we can really understand nuanced differences, things like that. We ask every year, what are your top five strategic business priorities in your own words? We do not want to bias them by suggesting things that they might want to pick, because they do tend to pick things they think people want to hear. So we derive the category structure directly from what they actually say. And as you can see, growth is top, right, as I said, of that list. And Workforce is right up there in second. There's only a one point difference in this current data between workforce and growth. That has displaced technology related into third position. Technology related remains strong. I will remind those who've never seen this before, as we always do, that in 2013, the technology related bucket, using exactly the same method, was actually in position 11. Right? And it grew and it grew and it grew and it came up to be much more of a foreground business leader issue throughout the last decade. And we had some acceleration around COVID, right? Working from home, more e-commerce. So technology-related change still remains very high in direct CEO interest and priority, but it has been supplanted by the workforce crisis. Now we've got a new category in here, which you can see down there at number nine. Every now and then, some new factor comes in that just isn't in our category structure because we've never seen it in the last dozen years. And we've never seen anyone significantly talk about inflation as a serious, distinct issue in a dozen years. They might have talked about pricing and stuff, but they're not really worried about inflation. Now, inflation is an issue, right? So managing for inflation has become a designated, specific CEO concern. Perhaps... What's surprising, though, is that despite the fact that inflation is such a rising concern, productivity and efficiency, which is a bucket that we have in this data, isn't even on the chart. In fact, in recent years, it's been hovering down the bottom end, and I've been quite concerned that productivity and efficiency has not been a foreground issue for CEOs personally. Now it's actually gone backwards. Right? I don't think that's sustainable. That is not sustainable. That has to flip. Either inflation disappears or productivity becomes a big issue. But you can't have both. That's a very strange and unusual finding. And that's what I mean about the sense of confusion. I'm not, you know, calling anybody stupid here, right? This is a really weird time. Um, you know, I think, you know, we have a, 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 a magazine output now from Gartner called Gartner Business Quarterly. And it talks about dealing with a weird economy in the current issue, and that's about right. So given all of this, navigating these very unusual and often unpracticed conditions, situations which CEOs personally have not seen before, right, they're going to tend to be, on average, a little bit more ponderous, a little bit more cautious, a little bit less certain about what step to take next and in which direction. You, as CIOs and other technology leaders, as members of your executive teams, as full members of those executive teams, you can win for yourself, for your chief executive, and for your company 
if you can focus on helping that chief executive to become more quickly decisive. How can they get to decision? How can they get to decision faster, given that the situation is so confusing? Situation confusing, information helps, in theory. So it should be part of what you do to contribute changes that will help resolve that confusion and move to action faster. Your CEO needs from you proactive, technology-related, business ideas, and potentially net new data insights from you. Proactive meaning there is something you could do, right? You could go, all right, like, it's all gone a bit strange, and I don't know what the budget's going to be next year, and, you know, the business is bickering and doesn't seem to know what it's doing, and the CEO doesn't seem to be sorting things out, so I'll tell you what. We'll be carrying on doing next year, at least for the first half, pretty much what we were doing at the back end of this year. We'll just carry on those projects, carry them forward, increment them forward. And essentially, I'll kind of lean back a bit and wait until the, you know, these other business leaders decide what they want to do next and where they want to head, and then I'll support them with whatever technology-related changes we might want to bring. But that would be too reactive. What you need to do now is say, OK, I'm reading the papers, I understand the world, I have my hands on, fingers on the pulse, I know what our systems are telling us, I know things that our systems are telling us that they don't know our systems are telling us, and I'm going to move forward with suggestions based on my intuition, based on my logic, based on my analysis, to help move the debate, not because they're going to do what you tell them to do, but because that contribution will help with a sharper, faster debate in the C-suite that makes you get to action quicker. So there's three areas that I think you can focus on to achieve this. The first one is to say, look, we want to amplify the capabilities that you have around analytics and really bring them to bear on this problem. The second one is, we've got lots of digital capability that we've been building up, our platforms, our agile teams and all that kind of stuff over the last five, 10 years. Now we're meeting a new situation. We're going to apply those digital resources a little bit differently. So we're going to divert that digital capability away from some of what it was doing and move it on to some other things that will help more. And then we're going to help by thinking about and focusing on how we will support a big rotation of resources going on on multiple levels within our corporation and within its industry. So let's look at amplifying the analytics first. What I'm saying is you need to look at the role of novel data analysis to help diagnose what is a very unusual situation and find superior solutions. You've been investing in your master data management, your warehouses, your lakes, your advanced uh, AI-based uh, analytical tools, your in-memory databases, your uh, all of that stuff. You've been doing that for ages. Now you've got a set of weapons that was almost built for this moment, right? Information is that which reduces uncertainty. Uncertainty is at a very high level. Your data tools should be on full force firepower on this problem, trying to understand what on earth is going on. But there's a bit of a concern around this. We've been doing this for over a decade. And here's an issue looking at a question that we asked back in 2013, and we've asked again recently in exactly the same way. This is one of these binary questions, a bit like I was doing with Wenger this morning, where you just kind of force the thing a bit with two options to get, a, uh, to get uh, people off the fence. So do, as a chief executive taking my survey, do you agree more with the idea that there is no such thing as too much information? It's all good. Or do you believe really that information overload is a problem, and we're just getting confused and it's reaching crisis levels. Now, we asked this in 2013, as you can see. We had a 43-57 split, with 57 saying they were in information overload. As you can see now, we're down to 49 saying information overload. Progress. Progress. 10 years? 10 years, and still half of them are saying we're in information overload? Hmm. It's not great, is it? You know? You know? Someone, comment, someone commented to a friend of mine recently about you know, what they thought about Mark Raskino. It was like, he's kind of like talking to your professor who's a bit disappointed with you. Sorry about that. But I am a bit disappointed with this, right? I, we should all expect that that was a bit better by now. 
But who's really been in charge of the issue? You've been asked and tasked to build all kinds of complex and advanced data and analytics systems over that decade. And for the most part, the task of deciding what data we should hold, why we should hold it, the task of analyzing it for a business value result, that resides more in other departments other than yours, in various departments and business units other than yours. And I think maybe given this, that all of them haven't really shifted this very far, you might want to think about taking just a little bit more ownership of deciding how we will use this data, why we will point our tools at these specific questions, and what results we'll get out. And really proactively, you do the analysis rather than building the tools for other people to do the analysis. Now, it's always a balance, right? I'm saying that we want to move the needle, right? Move the needle a little bit more, so that you're taking some of your people of your own volition, pointing them at unanswered questions that nobody has actually asked yet, and start building your own analysis, and then taking that analysis proactively into the room to directly penetrate this fog in business right now where people don't quite know what's happening. Because oftentimes, they're going to need the use of new data factors that they didn't know you even had, right? That, well, location data or something like that, that could be brought to bear that they don't know that could be brought to bear. And you're in a kind of a, you don't want to wait for, a, for, that, for that to be asked. Let me give you an example, right? When we ask chief executives about this inflation question, we ask, what is the number one action you're going to take to, in response to inflation? You've raised it, CEOs, as a top 10 issue. The top answer is, raise my prices. Yeehaw, raise my prices. All right, that's easy. Like, my input costs are going up, my wages are going up, my supply chain costs are going up, you know. So I'll tell you what, I'll have to just increase my prices. That's that, and yeah, all nice and easy. Well, okay. but it doesn't work, does it? It works once, it works twice, you know, and then it stops working. And I've read already some chief executives really quite concerned that they're not going to get away with it anymore. So then if we're in that situation, all kinds of new questions come up. Because maybe our pricing model has been pretty similar for quite a long time, maybe even a decade. Maybe people haven't really looked at the reasoning, the logic, the model of, that we have for pricing. So how frequently should we update prices? How many price points should we have in a market? Right? Should we have 11 prices or 256 prices or 97,000 price points? You know, it depends on your industry. But what would optimization look like? How does the elasticity of demand vary by market segment? Indeed, what segmentation would we even look at for elasticity? Where will people be more elastic and where will be less elastic in response to these rapid and sequence of increases? And indeed, when will we run out of road? At what point do we say the price of our product has gone above a level where we start to create demand destruction? People just walk away and they say, do you know what? I don't need cupcakes. They're not good for me anyway. I'm not going to buy cupcakes anymore, right? And I think there's a lot of imponderables there. And often you know this. Businesses and their cultures often lag in looking at changes to their fundamentals of thinking around something like prices. But you have all the data and analytics at your disposal to start playing with these questions and start sparking the debate using your artificial intelligence and your data science. Now, here's an example of a CEO's UPS thinking this way around. She says, I've got a new tool we've just introduced. It's providing pricing analytics to our sales teams. As a result of this new pricing tool, discounting, you know, when our sales teams are negotiating with their customers, discounting is lower in 41% of our volume, our big uh, contract wins. This is coming out of her quarterly update about a quarter ago, right? What I really like about this quote, particularly, is the last line. Pricing science really rules here. Ooh, I like that. Yeah? Data science and pricing. Pricing science. Like, it's your opportunity to take ideas like that into the room and say, we could make more momentum here. We could move forward. Let's look at the next area, which is diverting digital. I'm just going to suggest to you that we ease some of the digital effort that we've been placing bets in certain places and start using that same capability and just twisting it around a little and aiming it somewhere else. Not a massive move, but a tuning move. 
So right now, digitalization remains a really important priority for CEOs. You know, it's a common word that they use. I think digitalization, though, as opposed to digital, is actually starting to kind of, if you say just digital, it often goes digital marketing, digital commerce. If you say digitalization, people are tending to start to think about the inside of the company, not just the outward facing part of the company. And I think that's what's going on as CEOs increasingly use the word digitalization. They're looking at it in totality across the insides of their corporations, not just the market facing parts. So if we're thinking about more internal efficiency, leaning into productivity proactively, then we want to just tune away a little bit from price and promotion, pr from promotion, sorry, to productivity. What I mean by promotion, do you really need to spend so much money on digital marketing, right? A lot of companies right now, their problem isn't customer demand, their, co their problem is actually supply, right? That's why in my initial part, we show that CEOs are more focused on the employees than they are on the customers. The customers are kind of there, the employees can't, kind of aren't here. My problem is I haven't got the capacity to safely supply at quality levels I want to. So I have to start thinking about more about productivity and less about promotion. If my digital efforts and budgets and monies are all spent saying, buy stuff from us, buy stuff from us, what's the point if we can't supply? Productivity will become a really big issue. So this is um, uh, the Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia. So every country has its kind of organization of CEOs and board directors and things like that. This is the one for Australia. And I like this quote a lot because she points out that productivity growth is at 60-year lows in Australia. And it's not like Australia is unique. I've got data for 38 OECD countries, and the line just keeps going down. Right? Productivity improvement has been diminishing in advanced economies for a long time, and we're now almost at crisis levels. And she points to the obvious, that if we're going to drive productivity up, it means investing in technology. That means turning your digital capability on the inside hard to really drive productivity change. Then we could move, tip a little away from customer experience obsession, and into total experience. Remember how important today employees are to CEOs versus customers, right? We've been obsessing collectively about customer experience management. It's a big topic. You know, how many digital channels can we have? Can you order it on Alexa? Can you order it by text message? Can you order it on the website, you know? Can you order it from a console in your Tesla vehicle? How many channels? We can have 13, 14 channels, and we're all very well integrated. And if you start the dialogue here, you can finish it over there. And it's beautiful, and it's smooth, and it's, and it's frictionless, and great. But do we get more value from investing even more in that? Or should we now be thinking about the total experience, which in particular involves the customer-facing staff? Here's a really interesting case study in point. You may have read in the press that Starbucks has some problems. It's facing some uh, unionization issues, which they're not comfortable with in parts of the business. And a lot of their workforce, that are actually their barista workforce that's actually serving coffee is not happy with them. The returned uh, originator, Howard Schultz, who's again the CEO, of, uh, is, is really trying to work on radically improving the employee experience. His head of corporate strategy, who is also chief transformation officer and chief digital officer, is working on that for him. And you can see those words there. They're doing work on the digital partner engagement platform. Partner is their name for employee. Universal tipping. You know how important tips are and managing tips in the restaurant trade, right? And how important that is to the sociology and the comfort levels of those staff. And recognition and badging. Badging is you know, what level or grade of, of barista am I, what color apron do I wear, that kind of thing. Now that might feel all quite small to you and rather specialized and to the coffee industry, but this is the kind of stuff that's now the swing factor. Because as he points out, you know, unless, the, unless people are coming to work for us who are good people, unless they're happy and tell their friends to come and work for us, and unless those coffee servers are smiling when you come through the door, our business is gonna suffer. 
And that's total experience, looking at the employee experience as well as the customer experience. Again, a tune-up factor. And the third one is to move away from those multiple digital channels and obsessing endlessly about yet more and essentially electronic or digital commerce and starting to look at grander, bigger technology-related challenges in our business today. And this is an example. This one's from Ford. This is the Ford chief executive, who himself actually was an automotive engineer, obviously a, um, uh, you know, a, a petrol engine or diesel engine kind of uh, engineer. And he's reflecting on the fact that the way we are all trained in the car industry is to only put vehicles into the market when they're perfect. But, doesn't name it, because of Tesla, right, you, and the software over-the-air updates, our whole system of thinking about quality is now different because of this software orientation. Now, in your company, let's imagine something broadly similar to this is happening, right? That some kind of dynamism update of product is happening because of the online connected IoT software enabled product as a service kind of world, right? And the CEO realizes that the, the, the dominant mindset of the firm doesn't really understand this change to the system of thinking about quality. And he's thinking, who is it who understands what it's like to maintain an ongoing service? Who is it who understands how service over the air software updates even operate? Who is it who works with updates that happen every other week and that continuity of 24 by 7 over the air? Who in my executive team could possibly help me to educate the rest of the executive team about these very important matters? I'm looking at them. It's you. You know more about that world, that cloud world, that software as a service world, probably than most people in your company. And so you're in a position to really educate and elevate the average of the leadership table into something as critical as this. But if your bandwidth is all soaked up with repetitively doing the digital channel thing we've been doing for the last five years, you're not paying attention to this next big item. And there'll be many big items, like the environment, for example. Finally, let's look at the rotation of resources. CEOs clearly see that talent scarcity is a crisis. Again, we've done a 10-year check on the same question, and then we've now got 80% agreement that talent scarcity is a crisis. And it doesn't matter if we go into a recession, which gives us the opportunity to slough off some of the old guard, some of the dead wood. We can get rid of those people because we've got a recession now coming in 2023, maybe. We can drop some people out. That'll free some headcount. We can get some new people in to replace Oh, no, we can't. We can't get any talent to replace the old people because there just isn't in the marketplace. The old mechanism of periodically firing people to create space to hire new fresh people doesn't work if the fresh stuff isn't out there to buy. And that's the situation that CEOs find themselves in. Instead, we have to redevelop our people. And redeveloping our people means the use of agile training, for example, using our technologies of online tutoring and training, giving people freedom of movement to self-develop in our organizations and to help them to elevate and evolve. And many of you have been doing that kind of agile work around training and redevelopment of people, but have you really industrialized it? This um, head of strategy at Bank of America points to the fact that the key here is not just the training and retraining, realizing that you know that the kind of people you need are actually already on the payroll, but they're not doing the right things. You can redevelop them, but it's not enough to have a little bit of redevelopment going on here and there. You actually have to make it institutionalized at scale. And you know, we talked about this at our CIO forum. We, are changing the thinking pattern about taking people offline to a little extent, redeveloping them, replacing the work they do today with AI, and that's not a bad thing because you're taking them and redeveloping them and giving better work to do. Creating a virtuous cycle out of redevelopment is the new pattern of behavior. And then the second rotation is around the circular economy. And this is Nespresso out of Switzerland is a good example of having gone a long way with the recycling of these coffee capsules. But we need to reduce supply chain fragility. We need to improve ESG scores with investors. We need to in, in evolve the brand and the value proposition and make it greener with some of our customers. And so building a circular economy that recovers our waste 
melts it all down, takes it all back, works for all of these problem factors in today's economy. But in order to make any circular economy mechanism work, you're going to need a lot of tech, right? You're going to need apps and AI recognition and sensors and QR codes, all kinds of digital information technologies needed to make a circular economy models work effectively. Online platforms, almost a business model in its own right. The concepts of circularity are really, really important. And um, they're so important now that even banks like this one in Malaysia are recognizing how important it is to the future of their economy. Clearly, it's a bank. It doesn't have a big physical supply chain. It's not talking about the circularity of its own business. It's talking about where it will invest, which companies it will back. So we're looking at circularity becoming a really important factor, digital being critical to making circularity happen, and big money backing circularity when we're talking about future corporate investment. Finally, we've got this issue of activity location. You have probably had to pull some business out of Russia directly, maybe, or out of the vicinity of Russia, perhaps. And now people are thinking about, well, how good are we? How dependent are we, perhaps, on Taiwan? What's the situation between America and China and the long-term viability of Taiwanese operations? And how do we de-risk all of that? We've got reshoring, nearshoring, friendshoring, all of that stuff going on. There will be rotations of the map where you are operating, where you are sourcing from, and where your markets are will all be rotating. And the extent to which you can support the business applications changes necessary to move, to lift, shift, redevelop, reassign, that's a critical capability for your CEO. Because as this Director General of the CBI, Confederation for British Industry, speaking on behalf of CEOs who possibly don't want to say this thing out loud, he's voicing it for them. Inevitably, we will accelerate towards a decoupling of the world, by which he means mostly the Western world, from China. These are very different times. So those are the three things I think you should pay attention to. You can download the deck and just revise uh, what I've said here. I believe that CIOs in 2022, acting as full, proactive, thoughtful leaders in the C-suite, Leaning on the kind of greatness you saw from Arsene Wenger this morning, I really believe that CEO, CIOs can help chief executives to find the right path for 2023 and beyond. Thank you for listening to me twice in a day. I think you've had enough, Raskino. Take care. I use my head too much Don't use my heart enough I sure could use your love To guide me I use my head too much Wish I could